Hello, I'm Kelda Yoon. For the first time in almost five months, MPPs are back at Queen's Park after an extended summer break. It was an opportunity for opposition parties to finally ask questions of the government, all as talk of an early election is heating up. Queen's Park reporter Lorena Redekop has been watching it all for us. And Lorena, what are the highlights of the day? Well, Kelda, it's been a long break, 19 weeks off. And so the opposition parties, they were all itching to try to corner the government, ask the premier directly for the first time in so long about the issues that where they feel he is failing. But instead, the premier flipped the script, surprising them with an appointment, a former liberal who's tasked with leading a team that's set to try to fix the family doctor shortage. Speaker, I have the honour to present... An unexpected announcement from the government today. They've brought on Dr. Jane Philpott to lead a new primary care action team. She's a former health minister with the federal Liberals, head of the Queen's Medical School. We're doing the work and I am thrilled that we now have someone who is going to be very focused on ensuring that every Ontario resident who wants one is going to have a family physician. The goal? To do that within five years. The news coming just as the provincial Liberals held a news conference well talking back, about their priorities. Health care, health care and health care. 2.5 million Ontarians don't have a family doctor. Philpott's new role means the loss of a potential candidate for Bonnie Crombie. She was considering a political future uh, sometime down the road and it was an option for her but she is committed to ensuring that we have primary health care teams here in Ontario. Opposition parties hope the government will take her advice. This is a government that doesn't listen to experts, let alone their own experts. They never do. Uh, the experts have been saying what needed to happen for years now. In question period, the opposition attempted to get a response from the Premier on recent scandals, such as the RCMP investigation into the Greenbelt. Can the Premier tell us why the RCMP would be looking at banking records in Europe as part of their investigation into this government? But instead, a backbencher answered the question. This is an ongoing investigation with the RCMP, and any questions about that investigation should be directed to the RCMP. Much the same on the deal for Therma Canada at Ontario Place. Which struggling Ontario family told this premier the answer to their problems was a luxury spa in downtown Toronto? The integrity commissioner is looking into the complaint. The integrity commissioner has asked that I do not comment on that matter. The only questions the premier did take on housing, using it as a chance to grandstand. Every single provincial Order. act we put forward, it's no, no, no. It's no from the NDP, it's no from the Liberals, it's no from the Green Party. Why would I say yes to a plan that doesn't build homes that people can afford? This afternoon, the Transportation Minister tabled his bill concerning bike lanes. I move that leave be given. It so far does not include language on removing bike lanes that already exist, but it could happen. That legislation will make its way through uh, the committee process. Yes, Absolutely, yes. we have an opportunity to, to do so. And after he spoke, the minister's spokesperson talked to reporters and she says that it'll be the province that will be footing the bill for any costs that municipi municipalities have associated with removing any bike lanes. We know that the province is going to be re reviewing all of those lanes that were added in the past five years. One of them that falls under that definition, that's the one right behind me running right past Queen's Park. Kelda. Right, thanks so much for that, Lorenda. Our Lorenda Redekop at Queen's Park tonight. Voters in Don Valley West are heading to the polls in less than two weeks to choose a new city councillor. The seat for Ward 15 has been vacant since May when longtime councillor Jay Robinson passed away. Tonight, candidates got together in Thorncliffe Park to answer questions as to why they are the best for the job. Our Del Manukduk was there. A panel of 12 of the 16 candidates running for city councilor in Don Valley West gathered inside the Jenner G. Marie Community Center, pitching themselves and their platforms. 
It's been promised, but I think with convincing the provincial and federal governments along with the support of the community to restore after-school programs that emphasize on academics and sport. I'm a resident of Don Valley West. I already work at City Hall, so I know how it works and doesn't work. And I think that what we really need is a progressive vision for the riding, which emphasizes family-sized housing, fixing our infrastructure, and really pivots on um, safety in our uh, streets. People my age are living month to month. They are having their rent increased above guideline thanks to the province. Uh, the conditions in housing are a lot worse than they've ever been. And people are just without hope. Uh, I don't see that being represented on council. Um, I am an architect, a bit of a frustrated architect, because I've watched how City Hall works over 30 years. And I think I know how to fix it. I also know how we can cheaply address climate change, which nobody else cares about, but what the heck. According to a liaison strategies poll, Anthony Fury is sitting at the top. The former Toronto Sun columnist has major name recognition, placing fourth in last year's mayoral by-election, besting several well-established city councillors. Fury's top issue is addressing crime. Intellectually, I knew all the numbers, but it's not until you get up to people's doorstep and they tell you the stories and they say in this house and that house and here's what happened to me. When you understand that the family situations and the, the real emotion that's behind something like uh, the rising public safety concerns, which is pretty much the number one issue right now in Don Valley West. Rachel Chernos Lynn is second based on the poll, bringing her experience as school board trustee to the table, as well as an endorsement from former Premier Kathleen Wynne. So there are different issues throughout the ward. There's things like traffic, infrastructure needs, development. But here in Thorncliffe Park, there's also very unique needs. We have significant issues in building maintenance. We need landlords to be held responsible. Thorncliffe Park is one of the lowest income neighborhoods in Toronto, with 89% households renting and 79% of residents being visible minorities. These residents agree housing is the major issue. The main issues in the housing issues, but the, especially the, uh, the state people and the low, uh, low income people. It is out of the reach of the, for, for the most of the family. The average household income here is around $55,000 uh, per annum uh, for this area, like Thorncliffe and the Flemington Park. Advanced voting is available this weekend at the Bob Rumble Center and Jenner Jean Marie Community Center. The by-election takes place on November 4th. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. One of two women accusing Scarborough Councillor Michael Thompson of sexual assault testified today. Thompson is facing two counts of sexual assault stemming from a Canada Day gathering in Muskoka two years ago. His lawyer is now trying to have the Crown attorney removed from the case. Arlene Harrison has the story, but first a warning to our viewers. Some may find the details disturbing. The woman in her mid-30s is one of two people accusing Councillor Michael Thompson of sexual assault. It's alleged the incidents happened at a Muskoka cottage over Canada Day weekend in 2022. She says the councillor touched her buttocks and breasts under her bathing suit after applying sunscreen to her back, and that Thompson asked if it was okay after he had already put his hands under her clothing. She says she either nodded or said yes, asked if it was actually okay with her. She said, quote, I didn't feel like I had another choice to navigate the situation. So no. She says she didn't leave the cottage afterwards because she and the friend who drove her there, the second complainant in the case, were drunk. She testified Thompson insisted the pair drink alcohol as soon as they arrived. They also shared a joint on the dock, which she says was instigated by the counselor. When the woman first got there, she says she was surprised to find Thompson there with just one other person, a young woman in university who also testified earlier in the trial as a witness. The complainant says Thompson invited her to a small cottage gathering sometime after they met at a bar earlier in the year. Because their relationship had revolved around business, she assumed it would be her and other professionals. The Crown Attorney asked her what she thought after the alleged assault. Quote, up until that point, I had certainly felt like this was a very strange situation, but that obviously solidified some of the strangeness of the whole situation for me, and maybe clarified exactly what the nature of the cottage trip was intended to be. End quote. After her testimony, the defense attorney briefly cross-examined the woman about photos that have been shown during the trial. The defense alleges the Crown broke the rules of the court by showing the witness those images and wants the Crown lawyer removed from the case. 
will file an application and it will certainly be argued in court and can watch the proceedings in court. Okay, so you don't want to tell us anything about why you want the Crown off the case? No. <laughs> Crown attorney Marie Newhouse argued that witnesses are entitled to be prepared for court. The application on the matter will be discussed on Wednesday afternoon, while the trial is scheduled to resume on Friday. Lane Harrison, CBC News, Bracebridge. Police are continuing to canvas an industrial area in Brampton where a fatal shooting happened over the weekend. The incident left one woman killed and three others injured. Nama Weingarten has the latest. This is where the bullet hit, came through the glass and hit the bullet, uh, hit the sign right here. It's been two days since bullets from a fatal shooting struck the windows of Kenny Singh's auto shop, with security footage showing officers breaking through the door in the aftermath. We're just trying to get back to normal. Police say the shooting happened around 6 a.m. in the area near Rutherford Road South and Selby Road, when a car pulled up, opening fire on a parked vehicle with one male and five female passengers inside. One woman died and three others were injured, including the male driver. There were multiple shots fired, but an exact number, I do not have that. There were two police vehicles here just earlier today, along with some caution tape. But those vehicles left around noon, and it's unclear whether they'll be back. Peel police said that they were canvassing the area, trying to find any potential witnesses or more security footage that they could use in their investigation. But as of right now, police are still yet to provide any details about potential suspects and are also yet to identify the victims. Leaving business owners in the area fearful as they have to deal with the aftermath. They let us back in at uh, 5 o'clock yesterday afternoon. You know, we lost some, uh, quite a bit of money. When we were here over the weekend, we heard from multiple people complaining about what they say is rising violence here in the area of Rutherford Road South and Selby Road. And reports show that in 2023, there were at least two shootings on Rutherford Road South. In one of them, a man was killed in a parking lot just two blocks away from here. And in another incident, a man was arrested for allegedly discharging a gun and firing multiple rounds at a business just down the road. Police say this appears to be an isolated incident, but they will look into previous shootings in the area. In the meantime, they're asking for anyone with information to contact them. Nama Weingarten, CBC News, Brampton. One person was injured in a fire at a residential building in Forest Hill overnight. Officials say they are still investigating the cause, but it appears the fire was sparked by an e-bike. Tyler Cheese has the details. Here on Eglinton Avenue West, just east of Chaplin Crescent, here behind me you can see the entryway to an underground parking garage of a residential building. You can see down there where fire crews had to cut into the door to get inside. Now Toronto Fire says crews arrived on scene around 12.30 this morning and say there was black smoke billowing from the garage door. Once inside, firefighters found about 20 e-bikes on fire and quickly knocked down the blaze. The exact cause of the fire won't be confirmed until a full investigation is completed, but fire services is warning people about the dangers of e-bikes and lithium-ion batteries. Well, with the e-bikes, it's very important that when you charge these things, uh, they're, once they're charged, you separate the battery from the charger and unplug the charger so they don't overheat. It's the overheating that starts to run away, and that's when they, that's when they run into problems. Also, uh, altering any uh, uh, chargers or batteries uh, to try and get longer life on them, that's, it's just a bad thing to do. So... Um, yeah, just be very, very careful with these batteries when they're charging and make sure they're off the chargers after they have been charged. Toronto paramedics have confirmed a woman who lives in the building was taken to hospital with serious but not life-threatening injuries, and some other tenants were also temporarily sheltered in a TTC bus for a period as well. The fire marshal is now investigating to determine what the exact cause of the fire was. Tyler Cheese, CBC News, Toronto. I can say that we are working with our federal U.S. Canadian partners uh, trying to determine the scope of, of this organization and this investigation. Coming up, we'll have the latest on the search for a former Canadian Olympic snowboarder who is now a fugitive wanted by the FBI. And it's a month into fall, but here in Toronto, feeling more like summer today. The temperature this afternoon pushing into the 20s. Here's how some along the city's waterfront are taking in the sun. Enjoying it very much, very happy to have this weather, not looking forward to winter. It's actually quite concerning even though we're enjoying the weather right now. Um, but also in September it was quite hot, like in Montreal we had over 30 degrees. So yes, I think it's concerning. I'd packed all winter stuff to come here with a few t-shirts, but yeah, I will be think I'll just be wearing the t-shirts. So. 
The temperature is nearly 10 degrees higher than usual for the end of October, as sunny skies and warmth are expected until midweek before feeling more like fall heading into the weekend. Welcome back. We are getting details today about an investigation by Peel Police into several homicides in Ontario that left three people dead. At the center of the investigation, former Olympic snowboarder Ryan James Wedding, who is wanted by the FBI for allegedly running an international drug ring. Greg Ross has the latest. There are two homicides that are at the center of an investigation by Peel Police in the OPP, dubbed Project Midnight. The first happened on November 15th of last year. 29-year-old Jagraj Singh was shot and killed at a business near Royal Windsor Drive and Winston Churchill Boulevard in Mississauga. Less than a week later, on November 20th, Jagtar and Harbhajan Sadhu were shot and killed inside a home on Mayfield Road in Caledon. They were here from India visiting their daughter, who was shot 13 times. She survived with life-altering injuries. I can tell you that Project Midnight encompasses the Jagraj Singh homicide and the two homicides in, in uh, uh, Caledon. Peel police are not saying why they believe these two homicide investigations are connected. But back in December, we spoke to Gurdit Sidhu, the son of Jagtar and Harbhajan. He says four days before his parents were murdered, an officer from Peel police visited the home on Mayfield Road in Caledon. He says the officer questioned his parents and checked their passports, but never said why he was there. Today, we got an explanation from Peel Police. The officer was there for a lawful purpose in relation to the Jagraj Singh homicide. Last week, the Sidhu's deaths were linked to an international investigation being conducted by the FBI in the U.S. They have charged former Canadian Olympic snowboarder Ryan James Wedding with their murders. According to the FBI, Wedding was behind a drug operation based in Mexico that used transport trucks to carry large quantities of cocaine up through the U.S. and into Canada. While they say the Sidhu's were victims of mistaken identity, Wedding has been accused of ordering the killings because of a stolen drug shipment. He used various lieutenants. He contracted out the killings he did, so he tried to insulate himself from a lot of this criminal activity. So it took a great deal of investigative effort to actually trace all of these acts to him personally. The FBI says Wedding is also connected to the murder of 39-year-old Mohammed Zafar of Brampton. At this point, Zafar's murder has not been linked to the Project Midnight investigation, although Peel police believe there is likely a connection. I can say that we are working with our federal U.S.-Canadian partners uh, trying to determine the scope of, of this organization and this investigation. I think it's incumbent on us to take a fulsome look into the activities of this group, not only locally, but also uh, provincially and nationally. Project Midnight is also looking into three other shootings at two Brampton locations in November of last year. Nobody was hurt in those shootings. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. A Durham police officer has been charged after allegedly failing to provide medical assistance to a person in distress. A news release uh, published today said, quote, it is alleged that in March 2024, while attending a call for service, he failed to render medical assistance or first aid to a person in medical distress. Constable James Wright, a 23-year member of the DRPS, is charged with failing to provide the necessaries of life. He was released on an undertaking and is currently suspended from duty with pay. Toronto police say they are seeing a rise in violent retail theft. To help better protect business owners, they were joined by the Ontario Chiefs of Police and the Retail Council of Canada to announce a new anti-theft guide today. The beauty of this guide is that by providing it proactively, everybody will have the same information with the ability to target harden and make their make their business less attractive to the criminals who would want to target them. Recommends stores have signage indicating the use of alarms and stating that no cash is kept on site. They say employees should also have clear instructions from store owners on how to deal with shoplifters safely. They also say workers should not physically interact with suspected thieves, but remain vigilant in reporting instances to police. Well, Colette, lots of people out in t-shirts today, some in shorts, really couldn't have asked for a more beautiful day out there. 
Yeah, just a beautiful yeah. weekend, an amazing day today. I mean, such a long stretch. It's not quite over yet. So uh, we have at least another day, and then Wednesday's kind of our transition day. And I'll show you what I mean here as we check out the jet stream, okay? It's allowing all of this mild air to stretch. Well, not in Alberta, very cool there, but into southern Saskatchewan, Manitoba, course across Ontario and even further east from there. That was today. Tomorrow, the same thing. It just starts to change and slide across northwestern Ontario. So that's along a frontal boundary. But Wednesday, getting closer and closer to kind of seeing the door closing on this weather. And then there we are into a trough with the jet stream by the time we get to Thursday. And really, it's just pushing us back to uh, seasonal numbers or temperatures for this time of year. Daytime highs today just just some incredible readings that we are looking at here. Uh, Hamilton, we've got a couple of reporting stations there. So uh, further away from the water, it was actually 26 degrees in the hot spot in Canada at one point today, not just in Ontario. Uh, clear skies clearly at night and during the day, allowing the sunshine. And it's not just here over the Great Lakes, over all of the Great Lakes, not just the lower Great Lakes, uh, a broad area impacted by this ridge of high pressure that's bestowing the this weather. Here it comes, okay, this is Tuesday night. So as we get towards Tuesday night, we'll get the wind starting to pick up a little bit. Uh, you'll notice that more into Wednesday. The cold front comes in, I don't know if you saw that, it was pretty quick, but it kind of breaks apart in terms of the rainfall. More consistent rain in northeastern Ontario and pushing towards the Ottawa Valley, but kind of scattered showers. Now this will fill back in as it crosses the lower Great Lakes, but there's just not a lot of moisture here is the point I'm making. So it's more are going to be about the change in temperatures, the breezy conditions, the cloud cover certainly, and yeah, a few showers kind of here and there, not too significant. Thursday, we clear back out again. The sun will be back, so it's actually not a bad day. Uh, just don't compare it to the temperatures we've been having. And just showing you what's going on there with those winds on Wednesday. So we will be looking at some of them kicking up over 50, close to 60 kilometers an hour. 11 degrees, the overnight temperature tonight. How about 24 for tomorrow? Still mild on Wednesday as we make that transition. And there you go, Thursday, uh, back to where we ought to be. All right, thanks so much, Colette. You're welcome. And that's our show for tonight. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night, everyone.